Um, good afternoon. My name is Anna Herrera. My full name is actually Ana Karen Herrera Moreno, like you can see there, but you can just call me Anna. That's just probably easier. <laughs> okay, so first of all, we want to know um, the place that we're talking about. Uh, where in what is Mexico? So Mexico, according to Google, from Pennsylvania is about 2,247 miles away. I would not recommend you walking there. Um, yeah, <laughs> take a meal. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the official language in Mexico is Spanish, Espanol. Um, throughout the presentation, I will be throwing in a little bit of words in Spanish so we could learn some stuff. So Espanol or Spanish. Um, the most popular languages spoken in Mexico besides Spanish are Nahuatl, English, and Mayan languages. Now, English is a like a lingua franca that's you know expanding around the world, so that makes sense. Actually, in fact, my own mother in Mexico went to a specific school to learn English, so it is very popular. But after Mexico, there are still indigenous languages, um, such as Nahuatl. There's different dialects of it depending on the region that you're from. And Mexico, the southern border is was part of the Mayan empire. So there are Mayan indigenous languages there. So the origins of Mexico originate to what we know as like the Olmec people a couple thousand years ago before the Aztec empire was a thing. Um, uh, Olmec people, we don't really know like where they came from. We're thinking they, or they uh, migrated um, to what is today Mexico from Asia. Um, and they, we don't know like where they went, but we do know that a lot of what is Mexican culture, what was Aztec indigenous culture come from them, including our foods and traditions. Um, but yes, Olmec in Nahuatl literally means rubber people. So you wanna keep that in mind. Um, of the Olmec people around the 12th, 13th century came the Aztec empire, um, which is what Nahuatl, that dialect is from. I'm of Aztec descent as well obviously. Um, <laughs> and I, one misconception that we're going to learn about today is that Mexico is actually a pretty diverse population, so not everyone may look like me. Um, Spain did come and colonize the Aztec Empire, so there are people with Spanish roots, indigenous roots, Afro-indigenous roots, so it is a very diverse population. So of the Spanish roots that I'm going to use, because we're learning about food, I'm going to use the word comida, so español, is Spanish and comida is food. So let's get into it. So on the top left here, we have the ruins of an old Aztec temple. And on the bottom right here, we have a rubber head from what is the Olmec people, the rubber people. They would take um, the wax of a native plant, which are, the name escapes me, and they would make rubber out of that. And they're known for these figurines, which are still in Mexico. I, would, I like to call them like mysterious because there's so much about them that they left behind, but we don't really know, like, where'd you go? The best theory and the most rational one is thinking the Olmec people like evolved into different indigenous tribes like the Aztec empire. Um, so yes, they're very important in our history. All right, so Let's get down to the origins of Mexican food. Yes, we do have Spanish influences through the colonization of Spain, but we also have our own, including words within our own culture and food that come from Nahuatl. Um, so foods in Aztec and Olmec culture that were very popular. First, we have the classic tortilla. You know, if you ever had a taco, you ever had a fajita, tortillas are there for you. Uh, traditionally tortillas, however, made with corn dough, uh, it's called masa. If you go to the grocery store um, next to the dough, you might find these white bags of corn flour and it has like an ear of corn on it and it says masa. That is corn dough. There is flour tortillas, but those are usually used for burritos. If you ever had a taco, like an authentic taco, you're not really going to be served flour tortillas. Um, I've had tacos here, like I, I am American. So whenever we go to like Americanized Mexican restaurants, they do serve flour tortillas, but traditionally they're small round tortillas made of corn. Uh, so that is uh, Nahuatl word tortilla. And then we have tamales. Um, it's not hot tamales, not like the candy that you get in the, the red box. So you don't want to think that. Um, it is made with that same masa that you make tortillas out of, but um, if you've ever had like a steamed bun or 
like a steam sweet that you put in vaporized or like where vaporized vegetables, same kind of process, but it, it can be filled with beans, cheese usually, or chicken. Um, like I said, Mexico did have like the, the Mayan, uh, M Mayan empire down in the south. So a lot of things are uh, similar to Guatemalans who were also part of that empire. And they have these tamales themselves. Um, uh, they put the entire chicken bone in. And I didn't know that when I was little. So I was like a little Mexican kid. And I went over to my Guatemalan friend's house. And I bit into the tamale and I almost broke my tooth on a chicken bone. So yes. Introducing Mexico, we just put the chicken meat or whatever meat goes in there. We don't like to put the bone. Hi, welcome. Got a new yes, ma'am. So uh, you're welcome to try anything you like. Um, tamales originate from the Aztec word tamali, which means dough or masa, which is what I was talking about earlier. So tamali. And then stuff uh, like chocolate, which is very important in Mexico, comes from the uh, Nahuatl word of uh, chocolate. <laughs> chocolate, chocolate. Cho, like a little sh, but mix chocolate. Mix the T and the L and you get chocolate. Chocolate. Um, I am trying to learn more of uh, like indigenous uh, now with you words because I was never taught that. And I've been learning a little thing about that. So that was kind of cool to know that a lot of the words that we use today, like avocado come from aguacatl. Um, in Spanish is aguacate. So you can see how that sounds, aguacate, aguacate. And then we have guac, huh? You do? Okay, I'm looking forward to said book. I like books. Then we have guacamole. Everybody likes guacamole. Mm -hmm. um, comes from the Aztec word, a guacamole. A guacamole, a guacamole. Yes, <laughs> you, can, you can hear like how that sounds similar. Um, it, when the Spanish came, we kind of, huh? This is a fresh pineapple I cut in the kitchen. Yes, yes enjoy. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, um, they're just grabbing snacks from there. If I did make some fresh aguacamole, I did bring that. <clears throat> Fun fact, uh, guacamole you tend to get at the grocery store, unfortunately, is not real guacamole. Um, it is traditionally uh, made with a molcajete, a molcajete, but we'll be talking about that later. But if you've ever had pico de gallo, which is tomato, onion, and cilantro, sometimes jalapenos, it's that, but you just add an avocado to it and lime juice. That's mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. so. um, one thing that was very popular in our culture is uh, chocolate, chocolate, but like the picture on the right, it's not that type of Reese's or Hershey chocolate that you get at the candy store. Think of it more like the middle picture. It's actually very bitter and used in spicy dishes. There's a dish called mole, M-O-L-E, with an accent at the end. Um, and it's chicken and chocolate, but it's not sweet whatsoever. It's actually quite spicy. So the chocolate that we know today is not the OG chocolate. Um, the dish right there is at the bottom left. That is mole. It's traditionally um, served with rice and tortillas. Okay, so let's get corny. <laughs> yeah, so... Corn, um, we all eat it, summertime comes, we like grilling it, um, but did you know it started in Mexico? It has a very big cultural significance for us, both in our cuisine and even national pride. You talk to Mexican about corn, they're like, oh yeah, you know, corn in my country tastes different. It does, but it is something that we're like, eh, about. So it is of Mexican origin and it was made by farmers, you know, when uh, humans were starting to cultivate their own crops. Um, around this time, farmers were like, you know, what if we like combine plants? And it was from this plant where the kernels, instead of the corn you see there, they were just loose. And then another field plant. And then they mixed it. They say it's around 7,000 to 10,000 years ago, somewhere around time, uh, where it was made. And then we got elote. We call it elote mm -hmm. or maíz. Maybe you can think of maíz more because masa are like a corn maze during the fall. That usually sticks more, but elotes, that's what I refer to them. So 
um, if you've read up on the history of like Thanksgiving, you know that there was corn, uh, but how is that possible? You know, like we're all the way here up in the north and Mexico's all the way down the south. Well, when indigenous uh, Mexicans made this corn, they told it to, you know, the communities, uh, indigenous communities next to them. And then they did that and mind the pun, but they popcorn the idea throughout the country, you know, community through tribe to community. Yeah. Um, very funny. <clears throat> So that's why we have that. Um, I know, right? We slept. <laughs> so a thousand years ago or so, that's when we started uh, like sharing that. And that's why, you know, it's uh, cultivated and it can grow anywhere around the world, almost anywhere. Um, it is not only like made in Mexico, like here we live in PA. I live right in front of a corn maze. You know? um, it is very important to cuisine. So, like I said, it is part of our cuisine. We drink it. It is made into a dough, that masa. It's put into rice. It's put into food. Um, there's even like a boiled corn. Um, how should I say it? Like elotero, the man of corn, quite literally. Um, and like Mexican street vendors, we boil this corn. We put mayonnaise, tajin, which is like a chili spice, um, lime, and other seasonings and whatever. It is the best thing. Like, y'all got to try it. It's buttered. So then what I was talking about earlier, when I said about, about a guacamole, uh, the avocado or guacamole, a guacamole, is that it's traditionally made with a molcajete, which is on the top uh, left. Um, yep. Yes, basically, but make it Mexican. I, I find it, um, <laughs> yeah, I find it kind of fascinating that it is found in different cultures. Um, my church is Cuban and my adopted family is Puerto Rican and they each have their own versions of this. And, you know, Mexico and Caribbean and the Caribbean aren't that close. So it's kind of cool. Um, but yes, this is a molica gente. It's literally like a, a cylinder rock and marble bowl where we crush things. And this is traditionally where avocado is made. Um, so the uh, guacamole, sorry, not guacamole. Um, the indigenous word for it is molcachtu. They love, uh, the Nahuatl loves the tl sound. Yeah. So, molcachtl. Um, mm -hmm. And about the, the corn, as you can see in this picture, they do come in different um, colors. Uh, we tend to see more white and yellow here in America, I noticed, but they do come in different colors, such as blue and red and purple and all them fun colors. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to like a like a like a fall fair and they make like jewelry out of different colored corn. Yeah. So did you do that? So out of that cornmeal, out of that uh, uh, that corn masa, they make tortillas, which at the bottom right here we have a comali, a comal. Um, I guess the English equivalent would be just a flat pan, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and it is traditionally made, you know, outside with a big old round like this lady's making here. And she's using blue corn, like the blue corn tortilla chips you brought in. It's made down to that same corn. Uh, I don't have that type of furnace. I do live in an apartment, so I just kind of use a flat pan on the stove. But it works the same. So okay. make tortillas, tortilla. Okay. Yeah. In Mexico, um, indigenous ladies come to the market and they do sell tortillas. Mm, yeah. Really good. And then you so when it comes to Mexican food, um, one of the first attributes that comes to mind is spicy food. Which, you know, I gotta admit our food can be spicy. So let's get into the type of um, chilies that we use. You now let's keep it spicy. So one thing one of my family members from Mexico tell me is that the food tends to be spicier over the border. Uh, so like a, like a jalapeno from America compared to jalapeno in Mexico or different like spice levels, you know? Mm -hmm. My aunt came to visit us and tried these pickled jalapenos that they had in a can. And she was like, this is sweet. This is not spicy, but yes. So if you're not that into spicy food um, and you go to Mexico, maybe ask them to like lessen the, the spice level. Um, so we do use them for salsas, sauces. Um, uh, we do grill them. We use them as filling. We eat them raw sometimes. Uh, not very common. But I have some people eat them raw. Um, they're made for sauces, which is the same thing as a salsa. So most of the guy to Mexico's most essential chilies, one of my favorite chunks. So habaneros. Habaneros are very spicy and they're used in our cuisine. But some of the things maybe my cursor maybe shows, we have the chipotle pepper. When you think of chipotle, you might think of the restaurant that is an actual pepper. 
I forgot to bring them with me. Otherwise, I would have shown you. I'll bring it next time. Um, they're usually dried and like sun dried when we use them. Uh, same with the chile de árbol and puya. Uh, I guess the spiciness level would be like too much if you were to try it. If you don't like spicy food and you try that, you, you probably want to go to the emergency room. Um, then we have a cascabel and the pasilla all the way at the bottom here near the mile, cascabel and pasilla. Um, they're more bitter than spicy. They do have a kick to them, but they are tangy and bitter and they add flavor. Um, one of my favorite ever is actually the guajillo, which is next to the medium, and the ancho, which is all the way here to the right um, under medium. They're not that spicy either. I do use them for their bitter taste. So when we're making a salsa, what we do is we take out the dried out chile or we dry it ourselves and we grill it until it's like charred and then, um, and or we boil it and you make a salsa out of it and it's pretty cool. So let's talk about some of the peppers. So chile de arbol. So chile de arbol quite literally means pepper of the tree. Uh, arbol means tree, de, of, and then chile, pepper. Uh, so that's the chile de arbol where we found it over here next to the pot. It is longer um, and it is red, but it does come in different colors. And, and some festivities, some places in Mexico, what they do is they dry them out. And the good thing about it is no matter how much you dry them out, they still keep their color that they were picked out from. They come in like uh, red, orange, green, and they are dried and sometimes just as decorations for your festivities. Then we have the habanero pepper, which is one of the most commonly associated peppers with Mexico. Fun fact, they're actually Cuban. I didn't know that myself, so I started researching, but they do have um, Cuban origin, but it is still very much used in Mexican cuisine. It's mostly used in salsas. Uh, it's too spicy to eat it raw. Um, and if we use it as a filling, it's usually a salsa filling because yes, um, like a tamale, like a tamale, you would put that in with a chicken or whatever your meat you're using. They tend to be colorful. I don't know if they dry them out and use them as decorations like the chile de arbol, but they can be any color. They can be white, brown, red, green, orange, yellow. And I think that's pretty cool. You're adding colors to your uh, fruit and veggies. Then we have the chipotle. So when you think chipotle, like I said, you might think the restaurant. This is one of my favorite peppers. Um, there's like a pickled uh, version of it uh, that I use on literally everything chicken and rice, beef, whatever, it's going on there. Um, but yes, this is the chipotle pepper. And it is, it can be spicy. It is pretty spicy, but it has a flavor to it that I really like. So if you like tangy, bitter, uh, flavorful peppers, I would recommend that. They come in two different forms besides the raw. Um, on the top right, we have the dried out, which is, you're gonna see a lot of it in like Latin stores and plastic bags. Um, these are what you would use for salsas. You would boil this with like other things and then you put it in a mixture. Muy cachete, muy cajete, but if you're more like me, I just use a blender because I'm too lazy. Um, and then there's the bottom left where it is pickled and like aloado, like seasoned, and you would find them in a jar or a can. So because corn is so important, um, one of the things that I did mention is that we make them in drinks. This here is an atole de elote. Um, if you've ever had like hot cocoa away fresh in a pot or something, think of it like that, but it's corn based. It's not like chocolate based. Um, it is a very popular drink in the winter. Um, a lot of places in Mexico don't get like snow or cold, but in places that my family are from, uh, my mother's side is from Pachuca, Hidalgo. The state is Hidalgo, the city is Pachuca, which is the capital. It can get cold. It can get up to like the 60s and 50s in the winter, which is cold for Mexico. <laughs> So, yeah, um, it is most like hot cocoa. It is uh, very big during Mexican Christmas. And during Christmas, Mexicans, we go all out with the food. It's like everything from scratch. You know, you're making it three days prior. Really big. So there are different varieties. Um, I've tried a tole de lote. Usually have cinnamon um, on top, but this person chose to, you know, use corn, which is also something that I've had. And there's also a tole de lote. Um, which is chocolate based. So they put like the sugar, the cornmeal, um, the water, the boil it, and the chocolate, and it's really good. 
they're very creamy. So, avocate or uh, avocate. Avocado, don't knock until you try. So, fun fact, I felt like I was being lied to for the past 18 years of my life. I'm 19 now. It's been a full year since the shocking news that avocado isn't a vegetable. It's, it's a fruit. It's a fruit. I never knew that. I went over to my mom. I was like, Mom, I'm Mexican and I didn't know avocado was a fruit. And she's like, really? This whole time? <laughs> but it's considered a fruit because of its middle seed. Um, big old seed. You could grow your own avocado, but it, I don't know how long that would take. You have an avocado tree? Okay. So then uh, it is made into guacam guacamole, which is a guacamole, like I taught y'all. It is used in a dessert. So there, if you've ever had shaven ice, there's like a shaven ice avocado mm -hmm. or like a pudding made with avocado. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a friend from Vietnam. She's like, yeah, we have like shaven ice avocado. They use it over here too. So I call that kind of cool, you know, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. cultures. Uh, usually condensed milk. Condensed milk. And if, um, if you all heard of like the new wave of the avocado toast, like the fried egg on top. Yeah. Yes, or everything but the bagel seasoning. That's another thing that grew really big. So I found it online um, that it's become really big. And mm -hmm. and I'm glad that people are eating avocado toast because it's really yummy and it's healthy. Yes. But I find it like funny that many people think it's like chic or something new or like giving you like mm -hmm. healthy schmanchy vibes, you know? When I've been eating it since I was little, it's like an after school snack. Mm -hmm. Just like avocado with, with toast. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a snack I've always eaten, but I'm glad that's become mm -hmm. popular. It's becoming trendy, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, there are specific regions in Mexico. We all have a reach thing. I'm going to talk about two dishes, pastas y mamelas. First, we have mamelas, which originates from Oaxaca, Mexico. Oaxaca is from a Nahuatl. Um, if you ever had Oaxaca cheese, it is a life-changing, I believe it's cow's milk, it might be goat's, but I think it is cow's. I'm lactose intolerant, but I would risk everything for that cheese. Like it is, it is, it's true. Um, it's specifically made for quesadillas. So you know that cheese pool, like when you open the quesadilla, you need to get it. It can be a little expensive. It's like $6 per pound, but like a pound, all cheeses are. But yeah, there are Latin stores in Chambersburg and Hagerstown where you get it. And it's Chef's kiss. Um, buenísimo, sí, muy bueno. La comida, food, memelas that I'm going to talk about. Um, they're made with that corn tortilla, you know, by hand. Um, um, traditionally, it's made with lard. Uh, a lot of Mexican food, uh, a lot of our meat is pork based, or we do use lard. Personally, I don't like eating pork that much, so I would like use vegan butter or nothing at all. Um, but it's traditionally made with like a layer of a thin layer of lard, and then you put your cheese. Uh, here we have cotija cheese, which is a type of like crummy cheese. And it also looks like queso fresco, um, fresh cheese, quite literally, uh, but crumbled. And then you put your refried beans and then whatever salsa, you know, putting that chile uh, based on it. Um, and you have alternate toppings. So there we have cheese and what looks like salsa verde, cream um, sauce. And in the back over here, what we seem to have is like some type of red salsa maybe some squash. Mm -hmm. um, and then over here on the left, this green bean type looking thing, it's not actually green beans. Those are nopales, which we're gonna talk about. But if you've ever heard of the aloe vera, or seen it, it's like a cousin to it. And it's used in savory dishes and it has many health benefits, which we'll also be talking about. But yes, memelas, they're very good. Um, though I'm not from that region of Mexico, they're more Northern to me, but they are very good. Memelas, yes. And then this is from where my mother's side of the family's from. We have Pachuca, Hidalgo, which you can think of like Washington, D.C., Maryland. You know, Hidalgo is Maryland. Um, Washington, D.C. is Pachuca, the capital. Um, they're pronounced pastes. And, you know, Mexico did get colonized by Spain, but we do have French influences as well because France also was part of like our uh, history of colonization. For example, from my mother's side, I am Spanish and French, but from my father's side, I'm indigenous Mexican. So, um, yes. So, pastes is a big old take on the croissants and the flaky crust of it. Um, if you ever had an empanada, empanada is basically this, but make it croissant uh, uh, texture. Um, they can be spicy or sweet. 
I'm not too big of like sweet ones unless it's, you know, I'm in the mood for it and it's Christmas time because everyone loves sweets around Christmas, but I'm more used to the savory spicy ones. So the ones that I'm used to, they have potato, meat, cheese, and chile serrano. We're going to go back. Chile serrano is like a jalapeno, but it's much thinner. It's right here. Longer and skinnier than a jalapeno, and it packs a little more punch of spice than jalapeno. And it's chopped into like very, very little pieces. Like if you grab a spoonful, you have like one little piece of potato. Um, and it's very good. And if it is sweet, it uses like pineapple. Um, if you've ever had like a cookie with fruit filling in the middle, you know, those type of things. Think of it like that, but it's inside. And then there's arroz con leche. I've never had this um, inside a paste but it's quite literally rice with milk. That's the name of the dish. And it's really good. Don't think of it as like, you know, the rice you get at the store that's savory with milk. No, it's, it's specifically sweet here. Um, like rice pudding. It's, yes, it's Mexican rice pudding. Thank you for that. Um, but yes, if you ever have the chance to have a, a fast day, definitely do it. Um, have a bowl or napkin around because it's gonna be crumbling. Like I'm sure it's gonna be filled with pastry dust. <laughs> So then some vegetables and fruits that are native to Mexico. Like I said, habaneros are not, but I just put it in there because it's so like popular to us. Um, it's Cuban. Uh, avocado, the Hass avocado. I actually have it right here. Right here. This is specifically a Hass avocado. This one was specifically grown in Peru. It was grown there, but it was invented in Mexico, like corn. Um, but yeah, show y'all in the camera. A Hass avocado, the one you got at the grocery store. Um, Roma tomatoes. So those are not Roma tomatoes. Those are tomatoes on vine. Probably should have gotten a Roma tomato picture. But those little tomatoes that are like narrow and brown, those were also invented in Mexico. And parts of South and Central America have their own. And I guess they gave it to us or they gave, we gave them to them. Not sure, but it is very common in our cuisine. Um, so the original name for a tomato, Spanish is tomate but it comes from the Nahuatl word of tomatl, again with the tl. Um, in Mexico, however, you must be careful. If you ever go to the market and you ask for tomatoes, you're gonna get the green one up there. If you look up here, we have this green looking tomato with a shell husk around it, papery shell husk. That is a tomate. The one at the bottom, the red tomatoes, heat tomate. Y tomate. Yes, I was raised with tomate as red and tomate verde, green tomato. But my mom said, if you ever go to Mexico, don't ask for uh, heat tomate if you want green tomatoes. They're going to give you red tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Tomatillo is also a common word for them, too. Yes. Tomate verde, tomatillo, and tomate. Yeah. The green ones, yes. They are much better than the red and they're mostly used for salsas. This is where salsa verde comes from, green sauce. Salsa verde are with those tomatoes. Makes it green. So then, nopales versus sabida. So in the dish back in the mamelas, um, where I was showing you this one on the top uh, left here that looks like green beans, those are actually nopales. It is actually this plant here on the left. Now it is cleaned and all the spikes are taken out and it's like a form of you know cleaning so you don't prick yourself when you eat it. Um, they're found in the desert of Mexico. They're super, super popular in Mexican cuisine and super, super popular amongst diabetic Mexicans. Why? Because of its um, like medical properties, it can bring your sugar down. So it's used um, in Mexico. My mother would do for my diabetic grandfathers. Every morning he would make them scrambled eggs. You know how you put green beans in yours sometimes? we'd actually put nopales in there. And it's very savory. It's not like sweet or anything. Um, and then we have savila, which is aloe vera. It is, uh, nopales and savila are kind of cousins. Um, fun fact, savila sounds like saliva, which means saliva. So sometimes, you know, I would ask for aloe vera instead I'm asking for saliva. I couldn't say it correctly when I was little. <laughs> so don't get those two mixed up. Savila, saliva. 
So they are similar to both native to Mexico and the consistency inside of them, if you ever had aloe vera gel or anything, it is slimy and gooey in both. But with nopales, once you clean them out and like boil them and cook them, they're not that slimy. They have like a green beanie, like a green bean texture, you know? So definitely edible. Okay, and then we have this video that I'm gonna watch called the Mi Rancho de Cocina. Um, this is from a lady named Doña Angela. Doña is like Mrs. It's usually referred to older women or married women. Um, and her name is Angela. And she is a, 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 a small indigenous woman from Mexico. Oh, um, and her channel got very big because she shows us like a authentic, natural, let me go get some cilantro for my garden or I just killed a chicken you know, vibe. She is, makes really good videos. And she's making in this video, I am sharing the screen. I'm not sure if I'm sharing the audio, but like, I am going to translate what she says. Okay. But yes, you can see the, the, the video title there. Um, if you do ever want to watch it. De mi rancho tu cocina is her name. Quite literally means from my ranch to your kitchen. She lives on a ranch. So here. Tomates and the onions, garlic, and they have the chile poblano. And chile guajillo, like I said, it does come dried. It tends to look like this, like she shows it here. I'm going to skip here. I did mention when we make salsas, we grill our like tomatoes and our peppers, and that's exactly what she does it. She does that because it brings out the flavor. So when you do boil them, um, it comes with a strong flavor of the sauce. So you would just put the tomatoes in and, you know, it tastes raw, not very good. And here she's taking the poblanos and she's asándolos, she's grilling them because she's gonna take the skin off and she's gonna take the seeds from the inside off to make it less spicy. So you actually enjoy it when you eat it. See? Taking the skin off. And then a process where she fills it with cheese. And that looks like queso panela. Fresh cheese. Queso panela has um, almost no fat contact. It's considered one of like the healthier cheeses. Panela. So yes, she takes her roasted tomatoes, the garlic, the onion, she boiled the dried chiles, puts them in a blender. So after she puts that sauce to boil and she puts these to boil in them so that the cheese cooks and melts. So whenever you eat it, it like pulls apart. I've been looking here and noticed that you guys can see it. Yeah. See, there's the red rice. <laughs> so yes, um, her one of her catchphrases is make them. Um, one of her catchphrases is actually, uh, it turned out very yummy, just how like I like it. You know, <laughs> it's kind of cute that she's always mm -hmm. saying that. Mm -hmm. 